My name is Lizzie Kumar, and my paper with Leif Hancoxley is about epistemic values and feature importance methods. Today, I'll introduce the idea of feature importance and epistemic values and explain the inquiry we conduct in our paper. I'll talk about some of the epistemic values we find embedded in feature importance methods, instrumentalism, universalism, and emphasizing abstraction over context. And finally, I'll offer suggestions for explainable ML researchers that draw on feminist ideas, incorporating subjugating points of view, evaluating explanations in context, interactivity, and seamfulness. As I'm sure you all know, machine learning has become an incredibly common method for building automated decision-making tools in research and industry. Once these models are built, it is up to humans to decide whether they trust that model to actually make decisions, and after deployment, to navigate a world in which that model is actually making decisions. As state of the art models become more complicated, people are increasingly worried about being able to interpret them so they can do those things effectively. One of the oldest and most common strategies in the growing field of explainable machine learning is simply trying to quantify the relative effects of each of the model's input features. For our purposes, feature importance is any way of assigning quantitative importance to the input features of some learned function for the purposes of interpreting or explaining that function. Some tools you might have heard of include local or instance-specific metrics, which try to explain the model's output on a certain input. Some commonly cited ones include LIME, SHAP, gradients and integrated gradients, and counterfactual explanations can also be interpreted this way. Another family are global metrics, such as permutation feature importance and genie importance for tree ensembles. Saliency maps are also part of this category, where the features are individual pixels of an image. So why am I talking about epistemic values in the context of feature importance? Well, epistemology is a philosophical study of human knowledge, and key to any conception of what constitutes a useful interpretation are epistemic values, or desirable qualities of knowledge and understanding within a certain theory of epistemology. And while many feature importance methods are defined and justified in formal or mathematical terms that seem objective, the choices that were made in deciding how to develop or use that tool implicitly em embed values. The lens through which we chose to write this paper was feminist epistemology, which grew out of a reaction against scientific claims of unitary knowledge where largely white and male knowers have constructed one way of seeing as the objective one. I've included two of my favorite quotes from Donna Haraway, one of many voices in this movement, that I think describe the version of feminist epistemology that we're interested in. Feminist objectivity is about limited location and situated knowledge, not about transcendence and splitting of subject and object. Relativism and totalization are both god tricks promising vision from everywhere and nowhere equally and fully, common myths and rhetoric surrounding science. So here are some examples of things that are valued in a feminist epistemology. And not every thinker in this field would agree with every point here, but they're generally thought of as being under this umbrella. One is pluralism, which is the idea that knowledge is situated or contextual, and there are many locally correct truths from different perspectives which together form a more complete truth. Another is standpoint theory, or the idea that Marginalized individuals are better suited to provide objective accounts of the world because of their unique social position. And another is interactivity, which is the idea that objects of knowledge are not just passive with static properties, but should be considered as agents that can enter into conversation with the knower. In keeping these values in mind while thinking about machine learning explanations led Leif and I to write this paper by asking the following questions. What are the epistemic values implicit in feature importance methodologies? Are these values in conflict with feminist epistemology? If so, can these conflicts help us understand the suitability of feature importance for explanation purposes? And finally, how could we approach explainability to be more aligned with feminist thought? So let's talk about the first question. What are the epistemic values at play when feature importance techniques are proposed? We'll start by giving a brief history of how one epistemic value, instrumentalism, came to dominate feature importance methods. 
Some descriptions of this idea of feature importance mirror this one from the popular book, The Elements of Statistical Learning, which frames feature importance as a tool for feature selection. Often, only a few of the features you fed into your model have substantial influence on the response, and some are irrelevant and could just as well not have been included. Measuring the importance of a feature to determine whether it should be used in a model of a data generating process is an old statistical idea, but using it for interpreting a black box model is a relatively new idea. In particular, the idea of assigning importance based on predictive performance versus some other statistical notion of model fit was really not a concern until people started being able to extract predictive insights from uninterpretable functions of huge variable sets due to advances in computing. Matthew Jones argues that Leo Bryman, who developed the idea of decision tree ensembles, had his perspective on modeling drastically shift when he worked in the defense industry. In this way, the historically contingent fact that Bryman worked in defense led to a shift in epistemic values that has persisted to this day. Leo Bryman proposed a new influential view of data analysis, which de-emphasized the importance of developing probabilistic models of underlying data generating processes. He argued that a prediction centered view was the right way to investigate relationship between the response and predictor variables, and that black box algorithmic models can provide more reliable and interesting information than weakly predictive models can. He also pitched one of the first so-called feature importance techniques, which was based on the change in a random forest model's accuracy on out-of-bag samples when the feature of interest is scrambled. Even though his personal view was that variables were only important if their deletion impacted accuracy, his goal when he calculated these importances was not to simplify or prune high-dimensional models at all, if it wasn't necessary as he believed that the advantage of using trees was exactly that it allowed one to avoid doing feature selection. His goal was instead to appease those who had interpretability concerns, which he wrote was a secondary goal that could be finessed. And so we argue that this form of feature importance was born from the value of instrumentalism, the view that the value of a scientific theory is determined by the extent to which it helps make accurate predictions and not by an absolute or literal notion of truth. And while some have taken a stance on whether or not this aligns with feminist theories, the point is that this choice is not neutral, which has also been pointed out in other contexts. This story of how instrumentalism became a dominant epistemic value leads us to question other epistemic values prevalent in the feature importance literature. The net the next epistemic value we'll discuss is universalism. Something that we have been seeing a lot of in the explainable ML literature recently is the method of stating some desirable quantitative properties up front, taking these properties to be desirable for all explanations, and then trying to derive explanation methods with which satisfy them. And this seemed to be a very convincing argument for many people because these methods are popular and keep getting used or built upon, especially Shapley values. If you're not familiar, the Shapley value is an idea from game theory that allocates the value of a coalitional game among players in accordance with these axioms. The idea behind Shapley value explanations is that a prediction from a model can be interpreted as a game and the features can be interpreted as the players. And thus the allocation of the prediction among the features become their importances. The appeal of Shapley values is that once you impose all three axioms, there is a unique solution to the allocation problem. But we want to examine the idea that explanation design should be done this way. While it's good to be able to say something definitive about the behavior of mathematical tools, the fact that this methodology is valued in our field may tempt researchers to impose axioms for the sake of imposing axioms in order to arrive at a unique solution. I really like to highlight this excerpt about the third Shapley value axiom, additivity, from a game theory textbook which casts doubt on why it is included at all. The authors of this book call it mathematically convenient but hard to motivate, and this criticism has been around for decades. The cautionary point that we're making here, which is not to assume that some kind of nice mathematical property will result in useful explanations, has been made by other papers in the, in the last couple of years which have supported their points with user studies. 
So even though this is not a novel criticism, we can actually connect this point back to our feminist lens. The temptation to show there is a universal or unifying solution to the problem of explanation, which I've called universalism here, is in tension with the value of pluralism, which is a point that has been made in the context of HCI and design because different qualities may be desirable in different settings and by different users. Another value we sometimes see in the feature importance literature is the tendency to try to explain the model in a vacuum rather than in a real life context when it's operating on real data in realistic ap applicational contexts. One example of this value in action, which I'm sure many of us are guilty of, is it attempting to empirically demonstrate the success of some method in a contrived manner that doesn't reflect the reality of how it will actually be used and to what end. And maybe you'd say, oh, if we had more time or resources, of course we would do that, but uh, that's still a choice that papers without that kind of experimentation can still get submitted and get published. Another example is the proposal of axioms such as input invariance, which posit that explanations should be robust to certain transformations of the training data. Finally, many feature importances are calculated by running potentially unrealistic inputs or out of distribution samples through a model. This includes SHAP, or at least the most popular implementation of it, as well as other permute and predict methods such as permutation feature importance and counterfactual explanations. These methods or assumptions all have the effect of abstracting the explanation method away from the contexts in which it will be used to impact real human lives. Some of these properties can lead to issues, which again have been pointed out by other researchers. For instance, in the setting of recourse, where a model has made a decision about a user that the user then wants to change, such as their credit application being denied, feature importance explanations that show them how to navigate to the model's decision boundary may appear to be helpful as they can show an individual which features they might have to prioritize changing, such as their income to be approved. In reality though, there are assumptions about the user that you have to make for that kind of explanation to be informative. In particular, there may not be actions that the user can take that map to a change in the value of some feature. Additionally, being able to provide the most useful possible explanation for the user would require incredibly detailed information about that user, resulting in a tension between usefulness and privacy. As for the out of distribution problem, there is some evidence of undesirable consequences that come from evaluating models on out of distribution samples, including vulnerability to adversarial attacks and bias towards extrapolation behavior. We can connect this back to feminism by saying social context matters, and we should consider the data that we operate our model on as part of a larger socio-technical problem setting. So I will just briefly mention some of the alternative ways to ex approach explanation from a feminist perspective. One suggestion is to incorporate subjugated points of view when designing tools for understanding systems. Since knowers are not interchangeable, those affected by algorithmic systems know better than ML researchers about what, kind of, what kinds of tools will help them understand those systems. An example of designing transparency tools based on this theory was presented by Mike Cattell at FACT last year, where participatory methods, or a design process which includes the participation of a certain community, were used to develop an algorithmic accountability toolkit. And I'll note that this idea has also been explored in the broader context of machine learning in the participatory ML workshop at ICML last year. Another suggestion, which is maybe an obvious one, is to evaluate explanations in context. In evaluating explanations in a feminist spirit, we should consider various contextual factors that affect how well an explanation can perform its social functions, such as how explanations are interpreted by stakeholders, unintended consequences, how explanations perform in realistic applications as opposed to toy datasets or problems, and what contexts exist that could cause an explanation method to fail. Finally, HCI research suggests there might be more interactive ways of creating explanations. One example is GAMUT, 
a visual analytics system that provides an interactive interface to support the interpretation of generalized additive models. Interactive explanations would better support the feminist epistemic value of treating the system being studied as an active agent rather than a passive object. Another idea that reflects a pluralistic perspective would be to seamfully design explanations. Seamless designs are meant to make the usage of a tool natural and invisible, whereas seamful designs make the seam between tool and user highly visible. Seamful explanations would encourage users to avoid over-trusting one interpretation and keep multiple interpretations in mind. Some concrete ways explanations could do this is purposefully blocking the most obvious interpretations of explanations if they are misleading. For example, we could design feature importance bar charts in a way that reminds users that the features may be related or correlated instead of discrete and separable. Or we could illustrate that explanations are not causal when they do not represent causal quantities. We could work on ways to communicate uncertainty and downplay the authority of an explanation an idea that has received lots of attention in the data visualization community recently. Finally, we could design explanations in a way that is ambiguous and thwarts any one interpretation, providing multiple plausible accounts of the same phenomenon. Returning to our key questions, we find that looking at the epistemic values implicit in feature importance through a feminist lens can highlight potential weaknesses or failure points of existing literature and offer directions for the field of explainable AI built on feminist thought. Thank you.